the real reason he's excited that I do this is because his grandkids get to come. <laughs> We're on the way. Well, hello, everybody. My name's Terry Williams. Um, like his granddad said, he's granddad to me, sorry. Um, uh, I'm an OBGYN, and I first started doing this for him 2004 or five, something like that. And so you might want to wonder why in the world would an OBGYN come and talk at a, a WANA conference. Um, he was sitting at home uh, watching Good Morning America and the National Secretary of Education or something came on and, and they were talking about purity among our youth. And the, at that point, the Secretary of Education said it's unrealistic to expect our youth to be, remain sexually pure. And that was on the national news. And that struck him. That was, you know, over a decade ago. And he called me and said, would you give a different perspective? I said, sure. So that's sort of where this talk came from. And this talk that I'm giving today is not like the one I gave 12 years ago. It's, it's, it keeps changing each year. All right, he told me I had to point directly at him. All right. All right. Yes, the laser pointer is working. All right, it's not working. That's all right. I don't know how Christ spoke to thousands of people without a PowerPoint or a microphone and PA system. Uh, all right. Audience participation. All right, we got. Everybody gets to answer one. All right. Approximately what percent? of American adults binge drink and what percent of teens do so as well? What do you think? Now, the answers are all scattered. It's not always the worst one, okay? What do you think? Any takers? A, B, B, it's A. The numbers are actually 20, it's about 27%, the last stati uh, statistics I saw, and uh, 13 to 15% for the teens. Question two, it likes me if I stand in a certain spot. You might have to click it for us. Approximately how many youth smoke and use alcohol at least monthly? What do you think? We got a B, any others? A, it's C, a third, a third. And I, I, that's important, the reason I say that um, have that statistic up there is not for necessarily shock value, but uh, boys and girls um, that smoke and drink are 60 percent more likely to engage in immoral activities um, before marriage. Question three: What percentage of high schoolers are sexually active? What do you think? C. Yeah, it's C. The statistic has been since 1991, it's gone anywhere from 54% to 47%, and it kind of bounces. The last five to six years, it's right around 47 to 49% is where it, 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 it stays. Sexually active, if you're wondering, if you look at national statistics, sexual active means that you've had intercourse within three months. Approximately what percent of teenagers have had sex by age 18? Just at least one time. Sit. Yeah, <laughs> the ones that tell the truth. Um, it's a it, it, it's C, fifty percent um, as well. It stays about there. Now it changes at ninth grade. Ninth graders, that, by the way, um, if you who me has a ninth grader, I have a tenth grader. She's fifteen. Ninth graders, that's your fourteen year olds. A third. Um, 7% of kids less than age 13 have been sexually active. By the time, uh, seniors um, are around 60%. Question five. By age 24, approximately what percent of unmarried young adults are still virgins? So this is your people that are graduating college. A, yeah, it's... 92% of boys, 89% of girls are, have been sexually active by the time they finish college. All right. If 
thinks. Approximately what percentage of evangelicals are virgins at their wedding? So this now let's talk about the church. What do you think? A? Yeah, it's unfortunately A. So the difference between all Americans, and if we look just at the church, the difference is 10%. That's okay. It actually picked up that time. In the first 10 years of True Love Waits, y'all heard of True Love Waits? They have the big thing and they have the pledge and they do the rings. Uh, 2.4 million young people pledged to remain pure. After the first seven years, how many still had kept their promise? A, it's 12%. Well, just 12%. Approximately what percent of American adults use illegal, illicit drugs at least monthly? Gonna be any others? All right, it's a, it's a, it's only ten percent, not too bad. Now this doesn't count stuff like opiates because those are prescriptions; they're not illegal. Um, so if we included opiate addiction, um, which is rampant in the United States. Um, the list would be, so this is talking like cocaine, heroin, PCP, um, that type of thing. Um, this would not include marijuana. This would not include opiates. Um, this would just be your, more of your, would probably consider hardcore so drugs. <laughs> yeah. All right, next one. Approximately what percent of Americans cheat on their taxes? It's actually not too bad. The IRS thinks it's 30 to 40 percent. A. Of those that cheat on their taxes, how many think it's morally fine? See, it's about 20, 21 percent think it's no big deal. Um, so that kind of says something about where our society's at. All right, next slide. What percentage of teen boy girls have been exposed to pornography? Unfortunately, it's A. 93% of boys, 62% of girls have been exposed to pornography. And this is not just saw a nude picture of a nude woman or a nude man in a magazine or, or something like that. This is, this is on the computer. This is group sex acts. This is bondage. This is um, the wickedest stuff that you can think of. Uh, on the internet, 12% um, of all internet sites are pornography related. 12%. It's easy to find. And you got that today. You have that right here. You can get it at any time. And no one would know. Uh, next slide. Approximately what percent of men age 18 to 30 look at pornography on the internet at least monthly? And unfortunately, it's C, 65%, at least monthly. All right? It is very addictive. Approximately what percent of Christian men have looked at pornography in the last month? It's actually B. So the difference between, this was a study done by Promise Keepers. Uh, if y'all remember the Promise Keepers movement, they asked the men to fill out anonymous surveys, 50%. Um, so the difference between 18 to 30 year olds was around 65%. Um, this is all Christian men, 50%. Um, if you look at 31 to 47 year olds um, uh, of men, it's, um, about 45 to 50 percent. So there's not a lot of difference between evangelical men and the rest of American men. Um, how about pastors? Rick Warren did this study. You know, Rick Warren of uh, California Saddleback Church. He sent out a survey to a thousand pastors across America and asked them have, what percentage looked at pornography within a month. And unfortunately, it was C. All right, next slide. 
What percentage of Americans think abortion should be legal in all or almost all cases? Yeah, C. That is the trend in America. C. All right, next slide. All right, so there's a slide here. I don't know if you can read all that. So this is looking at abortion views among religious affiliation. So this is a white evangelical Protestant. Legal in almost all legal cases is the darker shade of blue. So this is about 25% Catholic, over 50%. Now remember, the national average is 60%. White mainline Protestant, about the same. Unaffiliated with church, 76%. We don't look that different, do we? All right, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. We can go back. It was black Protestant. Black Protestant was in the middle. All right. What percentage of Americans say living together prior to marriage is okay? Unfortunately, C. Uh, the actual number is 76% on the last poll that I, I saw, which came out in 2016. So cohabitation Pew Research Foundation, I don't know if you've heard of them, they put out a lot of stuff, um, as well as the Barna Group, say that 76% of Americans say it's not morally wrong to live together prior to marriage. Say again? Say again? Say again? Say again? Um, it depends. Right. To all the research that I have put up here for you, at the minimum, is one to 5,000. The national survey statistics on, say, the pornography and teen sex, those are youth behavioral studies. They're done by the government every two or three years, and they look at hundreds of thousands of youth. Um, so of the people that say that it's morally okay to live with someone prior to marriage, 76%, 65% actually is a, their practice that. And cohabitation prior to marriage has increased 900% in the last 50 years. And you can see that just based upon what's on television, right? So go back 50 years, you got Leave It to Beaver, okay, those types of programs, Andy Griffith Show, et cetera. Now look what is on today. Various studies show that 40 to 56% of Christians say it's okay to cohabitate. I couldn't find a direct statistics with a large number, so I, I put a grouping here. There were several small studies that I looked at, um, and they were in that range. So again, not that different. So why? Why are we slipping away? And what worries me the most is why does there not that much of a difference between the church and the real world? So are you shocked a little bit? I was. I always am every time I look these statistics up whenever I've given this workshop. And I haven't done the workshop in a while, my wife and I. Our family were in North Carolina for the last five to six years. I uh, uh, had a practice up there, and I haven't been able to do his workshop. And he asked me to do the workshop again. I said, sure. And I went back to look at those statistics, and none of them got any better. Uh, they were all worse. So if we are adults are setting the example for our youth, and you consider these statistics that I've shown you, do you expect the gap between the world and the church to change? Because we're modeling behavior for our youth, for our young ones. They look at us. And if we don't look that much different from the world, is there any faith there for them to follow? So do you wonder why our youth walk away, according to the Barna research, at a clip of 80%? Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So when I gave these talks previously, um, the first few times I gave this talk, I talked about the family and the f how the family should be a key role in changing these statistics. And I agree that they it still should. God's design of the family is not being used. Um, God's role for the family is it's a little small circle, a group of people that, can, that should evangelize the next generation. That's the way he put the family together. God invented three institutions, family, government, and the church. He has a design for all three. Far too many kids come from broken homes. That's the society we live in now. 
approximately 25% of kids raised in a single mother home in the United States. It's a quarter of our youth don't have a father around. 35% of kids have no contact with their biological father at all. None. That's 1.5 million children have a parent in prison in the United States. And a, poor, and a father's role in all this is very important. Okay? When I gave this talk subsequent years, I talked about the father a lot. Because we live in a fatherless society, unfortunately. In fact, the statistics that you can find on the fatherless society are very rarely easily done because they're done by the government. The government tracks this. How many of you have been driving down the highway and see, or watching TV and see a commercial or a billboard talking about dads? I'd have many times about the role of a father. So look at these statistics. I'm not going to read them all. But this is national data on fatherless homes. You go back just one more. It'll take a second to read those. Pretty bleak. The federal government did a study and they looked at the cost of a fatherless home. It's called the hundred billion dollar man. Because that's the number they came up with. And that was over a decade ago. The cost to the United States for fatherless homes in social support programs for moms, which are necessary for single mom families. $100 billion is what we pay. And that was over a decade ago. Okay. God's design for the family has not changed. If you remember in the New Testament, an expert in the law came up to Christ and said, what is the greatest commandment? Remember that story? And, and Christ quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting with verse 4. And this is it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Now that word impress there, um, you remember Silly Putty? I don't know if they make Silly Putty. And you, press it down and you can put it on comic book paper and fill it off. That word impress is like silly putty. It's like rolling your thumb. You remember you rolled your thumb on the silly putty and you left your fingerprint? You impress on their heart. It's like the child's heart is silly putty. And you impress your thumbprint right on it. You leave your mark. And that can only be done in a... Who has access to a, to a child's heart the most? The parents do. That's why God gave them to those people. After we impress those God's commands and the love for him on their hearts, we stand on this promise that we talk about a lot in Awana. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We stand on that promise. I stand on that promise for my kids. I see other parents that are struggling with kids that are wayward, and going, and I know that they are praying that prayer of Proverbs. But I think there's more to it. I, th I think that there's a glue that sort of binds all that together. And this is something that I've been working with in my life for about the last year when I kind of read a couple of books. And it kind of hit me hard because I know that I don't do this with my children as much as I should. Many kids are coming from Christian homes, but still going down the wrong path. And I'm not saying my kids are going down the wrong path. I have great kids. Um, I have awesome kids. I am so blessed, when I, especially when I look at when kids come into my office pregnant or with a sexually transmitted disease at age 16. I think how blessed and grateful I am for my children. More and more adults are straying away from their faith. But let's consider the early church. So we had Christ's death and resurrection. And we had a handful of followers of Christ, right? About 32 AD. 
then in the next 280 years to 312 AD, the church grew. And in 312 AD is kind of the big mark because Constantine legalized Christianity. At that point, there were 30 million Christians. Now, the reason Constantine um, legalized the church is because of his mama. His mama became a follower of Christ and changed his family. And so he legalized Christianity. So during a time of 280 years, when Christianity was illegal, you couldn't practice it without being punished by the law. And they had no Bibles. There were no Bibles. The Bible wasn't done, you know, printing press was 1400 A.D. They had no Bibles. But yet, we grew from a handful of followers to 30 million. How did they do that? How did they keep their faith and grow the church? Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Interesting little first uh, couple of verses there. Let's look at it a little closer. It first starts out um, with sin. And then if you noticed, if you go back to that verse real quick, Kitty. It starts off with sin which leads to an unbelieving heart. And then at the end, you're hardened. You kind of see the path that goes there? You start off with a little sin. So let's take, for instance, um, sexual sin, because that's what I deal with. So you're a young youth, you're like, well, I can handle this. I'll watch this R-rated movie. And I'm like, I can handle that. I'm grown up enough to do that. And then you're in a relationship and you start holding hands and kissing and then, and then you take another little step and you go to a little heavy petting and mom and dad aren't home so you start kind of touching each other inappropriately and you take another step and then boom, you can't stop. It's a little slippery slope that you slide down. And we do this in all sorts of things. We cheat a little bit at work. We cut a little, add a little time to our time card or stay a little extra. And we make a little allowance for this, that, or the other. And then we take another little step and maybe we cheat a little bit on our taxes and no one's going to know. And, uh, well, you know, I really need that extra bunny this, this month for that vacation. I, I won't do that tithe this month. By the way, only... We only, as Christians and the churchgoers, only give 2.4% of their, that's the average tithing rate of a churchgoer is 2.4%. If you make less than $25,000 a year, you're more likely that you will give more money than if you make more than $75,000 a year. But we just make these little allowances. We take a little farther step away from God, and we slide down that slope. You can go to that next slide. So we just start down that little slide away with sin. And the next thing you know, we're starting to lose our faith. It's a little unbelieving. And then our hearts become hardened. And then we're walking aimlessly down the wrong path. If you look at that verse a little closer, see to it at the beginning. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters. That literally translated means look out for one another. Hey, watch out. Look out. It means be in someone else's business. We don't do that today, do we? We don't get in anybody's business. Everybody, this is a world of pluralism and relativism. Everyone's truth is their truth, and it's okay whatever you do. But it literally means look out for one another. And it said to encourage one another daily. Daily. That's translated in, from Greek as daily. But encourage means to urge, beg, exhort, appeal to. So these people in the early church on a daily basis encouraged one another to keep them from going down that slippery slope every day. 
So they had to live an authentic life, and they did it in small groups. They did it as part of the small churches that met in homes. Remember, for that first 280 years, Christianity was illegal. They didn't, you know, on Sunday walk down to their local church and, and, and have a service. They were meeting secretly in homes. And in small groups, they lived an authentic life together. They lived together, and they got in each other's business every day. And they encouraged one another. And they were accountable to one another. That's the only way you can get this type of authenticity is to be accountable to one another. And so my question is, do we do this? What small group are you a part of? Your first small group is your home. So in your home, do you let your kids know or your grandkids know that life is messy? That you goof up? Do you let, if you're around a lot of kids, do you let them know that life is messy? Or do you put on a mask and say, everything's fine. I'm the chief offender. You could ask my wife who's back there pressing slides for me. How's your day, hun? Fine. Put on my mask. Everything is hunky-dory. How was your day at work today, Dad? Fine. When we go to church, we put on more masks because we don't want anybody at church to know that our life is messy. They might kick me out. Put on your mask. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. Fine. We're not authentic with one another in our small groups. So let's look at some another verse. With I think the writer of James had talked to the writer in Hebrews. Maybe they were the same. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Wow, there's healing in being authentic. So I could say, turn to your neighbor and tell them your worst, deepest, darkest sin. We kind of, I don't know if I would do that. Well, it says right here that it's liberating. Being authentic, taking away the mask in a small group setting and holding each other accountable is a source of healing and to keep you away from sliding down that slippery slope of sin of um, to unbelief and a hard heart. The next slide. Next slide. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, watch this video. If we can get it to work. If we can't get it to work, it's okay. The curtain closes and the crowd cheers, but all you can think about is that note you didn't quite hit or that line you forgot. And you can only imagine. We can go to the next slide. It's okay. The audio embedded, but the video didn't. It's okay if we go to the next slide. Oh, now we got the video. And the crowd cheers, but all you can think about is that note you didn't quite hit or that line you forgot. And you can only imagine what the critics will say and the words the crowd will murmur on their drive home. Or you walk down the hall after the big promotion. The long, hard hours have led to this handshake but the success doesn't shake the void you feel won't be filled and you start again to search for that thing your soul is missing or when you thought you'd have different news for parents about to be grand but you must tell your mom that you miscarried again and starting to feel like maybe you're the life that's lost and you're beginning to question if it's you who's to blame and you fought back tears so you could make it to mom's minivan where she gave you the cupcake intending to celebrate but all you wanted to do was forget the day you didn't make the team or get voted class president or homecoming queen was it the campaign you ran or did they just not like you or down the courtroom hall that feels lifetimes away from the aisle where you first said the we do's but he didn't and was it you or him that first gave up on this thing or was it just the inevitable ending from the beginning that you never saw coming or was it on that road that you drive every day, but that day you forget to look, and you regret every second the time stood still and any closer, and she might have been killed, and somehow you start to wonder and believe you might be a failure. 
these paths you've been walking begin to feel like your identity, and you start to believe that maybe there's something uniquely disqualifying about you, something unfixable, maybe defective, possibly, broken, probably, unlovable, surely, not good enough, definitely. Maybe you just don't deserve this. What if there was a different path? A path that felt like a home you once belonged to. A home where you don't have to hide the, oh, I'd rather not talk about that. A place where you are no longer defined by the if I could only measure up to's. What if there was a path defined by the eyes of our creator? Seeing with the light the one he created, a father who has no records of your past offenses or graph charts of how often you pray, where there's no secret agenda, no trap door, where you are not defined by self-effort. A place where you learn to trust God and trust others and allow them to love you. What if there was a place so safe you could share the worst parts of you and you would be loved more in the telling of it? What if you were welcomed home with the strength of a warm hug as you were picked up and wrapped close and told, this is home, my daughter, my son, come home. an organization called True Face. What he's talking about there is that spiral that we get into as we step away from God's center, our eyes focused on Him, and we start sliding down that slope, and we try harder and harder to get out of it. And you just keep thinking, if I could just work a little harder, I could be a better Christian. If I just pray a little bit more, Go do that self-help book that the pastor was talking about. Read the Bible a little bit more. I could be a better Christian, and I would please him more. But that's not, that's a faulty way of thinking. You can't please him more. You can't do life alone. Because that thought process of, Self-effort, self-help, trying to be better on your own is a not life of isolation. You can't do life with that mask on and be genuine. you got to take that mask away, share your life with someone, get help, encourage one another. He doesn't like you, honey. what the rest of this slide says since uh, there's a reason why Christ did not use powerpoints on the Sermon on the Mount um, is that this life of self effort and um, trying harder is all about you and that's not what that's not what you are it's not about you it's about him and realizing the love and the grace that he's given you and living in that love and grace that you are a child of his. Maybe it's going to come out. Living alone with our mass tends to lead us down that dark road of guilt and shame and self-loathing. And as a Christian, this tends to do as I told you and you try to hide the hurt and you try harder and harder and harder and a bunch of 
self-effort, trying to be more pleasing to him, and a fear, a fear that you're going to be discovered by those people around you. But God's grace is different. His love is different, and if we abide in that. I read this quote. I quoted this out of a book. The author is named John Lynch. I love this. Grace is a gift that only the non-religious can accept. And I'm taking this out of context a little bit. The non-religious is, is just the people that are involved in just trying to do life their own way. Not a non-religious in terms of I don't go to church thing. They're the only ones who can get it. They're the only ones who can use it. Religious folks see grace as soft. So they keep trying to manage their junk with their own willpower and tenacity. Nothing defines religion quite as well as a bunch of people trying to do the impossible tasks with limited power while bluffing to themselves that it's working. And I think, unfortunately, our churches are filled with folks trying to do life on their own under their own strength and self-effort, and that's not God's design. We need to be living life as if we truly understand who we are in Christ. Romans 8 says, you're adopted sons and daughters. I think of my father-in-law, granddad. Y'all know it's Brian Crow. I'm his adopted son. I know I can go to him with anything at any time and say, I need help. And he'll say, what do you need? He's always there for me. You're the same with Christ. He's there for you 24 7, seven days a week. He just wants you to ask. He wants you to trust Him that He's got it under control. You're His adopted son. 1 John 3 says you're a child of God. The Bible says you're loved, forgiven, redeemed, delivered, called, healed. You're a royal priesthood, an overcomer, an ambassador. You're no longer a slave, a joint heir with Christ, the light of the world, the righteousness of Christ, his elect, a new creature, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and the chosen. But yet we don't live like it. He is your Abba Father. He's your dad. And he loves you even on your worst day, no matter how bad that worst day is. That thought in your head that when I say the words of the worst day, you kind of cringe a little bit because you know what that worst day was. He loved you that day, the same amount that he loves you today. You know, in the Old Testament, Abba, Father, that term of endearment for a father is only used 15 times. Then Christ came, in the Gospels it's used 165. That's a radical shift. I was listening the other day to Alistair Begg, you know, Alistair Begg, uh, pastor. Um, he was on Moody, he does sermons every day on Moody. He was uh, relayed a story where he was talking to a a Muslim, and they were interviewing this Muslim about um, what uh, what drew you to Christianity. Why did you change your faith? Said, well, I I was invited to go over to some friend's house or whatever, and they were Christians, and I decided to go. He said, "What was it about the Christian that made you think?" He said, "Well, you know, they were nice and stuff, but that didn't what changed me." He said, "It was when they prayed." And they called him Father, and they talked to him. It is, we don't have that. We didn't have that in the Muslim faith. You don't have that connection, and that's what drew me. They, he was drew, they were drawn out of that connection of love. And when you're going to be accountable to someone, you got to do it out of love. A quote in this book that I thought was really good that I was reading. The book is called The Cure. The power of affirming love is exceedingly greater motivation than what can be gained through intimidation. When we do anything to pacify or appease a disgusted and superior acting authority, we begin to lose our person. Fear teaches a child to perform instead of trust. In other words, the motivation of grace will always bear greater fruit than the coercion of demand. Think about that for a second. The motivation of grace will always bear greater fruit than the coercion of demand. 
I'm, that kind of hit me hard. I have 15 year old, 13 year old, and an eight year old. And they're great kids, as I said before, well behaved. But I kept thinking, how often do I drive them for better behavior and they respond because of fear of their dad might get mad as opposed to they respond out of love. And am I training them to respond that way to God? That they try to act a certain way so that God will be pleased with them. What does the author of Hebrews said about pleasing God that you can't do it without faith? Not without behaviors, not without acting a certain way. It was out of faith that you please God. So what I think is God's plan for the family and as a father, myself, is that we live life knowing who we are in Christ. And we teach that to our kids. We teach that to our Awana kids, who they are in Christ. And you teach that in small group setting. And you teach them about his love and grace and his mercy, and how even on their worst day, he can't, he's not going to love them any less, and he can't love them anymore, because they're his sons and daughters. We need to be authentic, take away our masks, be authentic in our small groups, share one another what's going on in our lives, and encourage one another, look out for one another, because on your worst day, when you started taking that slippery step away and you kind of slid that way, wouldn't you wish someone had come up to you and stopped you before you got way down low and would have said, hey, don't go there. It's not the place to go. Did you all see this picture? Did you all see this news story? July 11th. There were two boys. I forgot their ages. I According to what I looked on, their, on the, I remember on the picture, one's about this tall and this tall, so I'm guessing somewhere about six and eight. They got caught in a riptide out in Panama City, and out they went, and they couldn't get back. And they had four family members that saw them, mom and sister and whatnot, and they went out to get them, and they couldn't get them. They got caught out in the riptide, and they're out there drowning. And the people on the beach saw it, and they formed a human chain, 80 of them, and they locked arms, and they got out there and got those kids and that family and brought them back. That's what we need to do. That's a picture of God's plan for a small group, to helping one another when people are starting to drift away, pull them back in. Remind them of who they are in Christ. Remind them of the love he has for them and that his grace is sufficient. God is not afraid to risk the consequences of our sin with his grace. It doesn't faze him at all. He's got it covered. Remind people of that and get them back. So, anybody any questions? I think we finished early. Usually I run over, so I cut like 20 slides out of this. This is doable. This is different. I pulled this. this is, none of this is me, okay, by the way. All this is taken from various authors of different things that I've seen and read. Um, if you're looking for any good books, um, Rob Reno. Um, some of this comes from Rob Reno. Some of this comes from a guy named John Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H. He's with trueface.org. He has a couple of books out there called My Worst Day, um, The Cure, Bo's Cafe, which is a more of a fictional tell with a point um, in various other sources. Good books just to read. Well, I hope this helps you guys out. we got plenty of time. you got plenty of time to make it to your next session. Um, if you have any questions or anything you want to talk to me, feel free to come up. I appreciate your time.
Sure.